All righty. That brings us to the speaker portion of our speaker meeting, which is always good. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Harold from St. Louis, Missouri. I can't wait to hear your story, your experience, strength, and hope. So bring it on, Harold. Thank you for showing up. Recording in progress. Right. Very good. Well, my name's Harold. I'm an alcoholic, and it's great to be here. Can you hear me good? Thumbs up? Yes. All right. Yes. Fantastic. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, I am from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm a proud member of AA on the Rocks, which I'm at the church right now in St. Louis where that meeting's going on right this second, right down below us. So strong three legacy group meets on Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Um, right here in, in the heart of the city of St. Louis. So if you're ever in St. Louis on a Wednesday, I encourage you to look at Bay on the Rocks, come and visit us. We'd love to host you. Strong, again, like I said, a strong three legacy group, co-ed meeting, speaker meeting, a lot of people here. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of fun. So I was just down there hanging out with them before I came up here um, to hang out with you guys. I don't know if you, if you, if any of you know Lulu from California, LA, but Lulu's here tonight speaking downstairs right now. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of fun. So I got to hang out with her a little bit before I, I came up here, but it's it's great to be here, Eric. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come and hang out with you guys for a little bit. My sobriety date's April 7th, 1987. And again, my home group's here. I come from a strong line of sponsorship. And so three legacy sponsorship, three legacy home group, uh, all, all made a huge difference in how my life turned out. So if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome. And I'll try to put some definition to some of those terms that I just use and why that's been important in my life and in my sobriety. I was just in Mississippi a few weeks ago. Uh, we have our sponsorship weekend every year in Nauvoo, Alabama at a big re uh, Episcopal retreat center down there. And so there was 165 of us from all, all walks, sides of uh, the United States in Nauvoo for the weekend for sponsorship weekend. So we came to Mississippi and played golf on, uh, on Thursday before we made our way down to the retreat you know our, our time together friday saturday and sunday so i was just in your neck of the woods and one of my best AA buddies when i first got sober and we were you know we were pretty glued at the hip for the first year or so he ended up taking a, a manufacturer's job uh down in hattiesburg and he moved to hattiesburg and it hadn't really we didn't stay in touch because that was before any kind of social media or so, cell phones or any of that when neither one of us had any money to speak of but when I, when I got to this invitation for Eric and he said it's in Hattiesburg, I said, man, I haven't talked to my buddy Bob in a long time. So I did some soul searching and I found him. And uh, so I was able to rekindle that out of this this conversation tonight. So that if I got anything out of it, I got to reconnect with Bob a little bit because of uh, this invitation. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I came to AA for the first time in 1979 through the Department of Corrections. And, uh, and I was coming out of one facility and they already had charges on me for another facility. So when they brought me from one institution to this detention center, it was in that detention center in 1979 that a couple of five members brought Alcoholics Anonymous into that facility. And that was my introduction to it. I, was, I never heard of AA prior to that, um, had no exposure to it, and was far from conceding that I was powerless over alcohol. It wasn't even close, but it was an introduction. I think it's on page page 105 of Bill sees it. There's a little, there's an excerpt right in the middle of the page um, of one of his letters. And, and the title of that is Chief Responsibility. And it goes on to say that our chief responsibility is to deliver an adequate demonstration of Alcoholics Anonymous to the newcomer. And, um, and so I, that's important um, because that's those adequate demonstrations that I had early on made it easy for me to say, yes, I'm gonna go back there later on when I, when I when the gift of desperation you know had me around the throat and i finally you know was surrendered to this thing but that was important um that our, our, our demonstration whether we're as individuals groups areas districts all of it virtual or in person how we carry ourselves how we walk how we talk how we respond especially to that new person is is vital um, because we may be, as we've all heard many times, the only example of recovery somebody ever sees. So we want it to be an adequate demonstration. So hopefully that is tonight. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome to this platform. And, and um, all this really came, really was born out of uh, the pandemic. Uh, there was virtual aid, motive to motive. We mentioned it in the forward to the, to the fourth edition that, you know, there were some motive meetings going on back in the day, but nothing like, like this revelation. This has been a revolution. 
you know, in recovery, big time. And uh, so it's brought opportunities like this tonight. So I'm grateful for that. Um, as part of my plea bargain in that in that in that situation, I was just describing. I had a parole officer. Her name was Lynn, and I had a prosecutor who both understood my condition more than I did, and they wanted to help me more than they wanted to punish me. And so they came to me and they said, "Look, we're going to give you a plea bargain, and we hope you take it. But we're, you you, know, you got you got a parole revocation, and you got this new charge. So you can either go back to where you came from for two and a half more years." or you can go into treatment for 30 days. Now I quit school for good when I was 13 years old, but I had enough math to know that 30 days was that got a lot shorter than two and a half years. So that was a, a no brainer, I'm going to treatment. So I went into treatment in 1980, this time it's 1980, and I made my way into treatment for the first time. And I was by far the youngest guy and there wasn't anybody close to my age. It was rural Missouri, right on the Iowa border. And uh, wasn't very many people in treatment. The treatment center was called Carry It. Um, and back then, and, and still in some circles today, most of the recovery inside those confined spaces that we call treatment centers was AA, it was the big book. It was most of the people that worked there were, were members of Alcoholics Anonymous in some level or another. And But the whole thing was predicated on, you had some small groups and one-on-one -on -one counseling, but everything else was just recovery, 12 steps, sponsorship. And uh, But I did my time and I knew how to do time. It was 30 days. and. And, uh, and they took me to my uh, first outside meeting outside of a confined space and threw us all on a, a, a bus, a minivan, if you would, and drove us off to a rural town called the Play Missouri. And I went to my first outside A meeting and, you know, walk into this little town, you know, less than a thousand people in this town and, and walk down into the church basement, typical A context. And, uh, you know, there was a woman there who looked like Mrs. Claus. She had big white hair, big rosy cheeks, been sober a long time. Her name was Millie, Millie Mays. And uh, she was sober probably 15, 20 years at the time, but that seemed like forever. And she was just a, an adequate demonstration of recovery. She was a, a gentle soul. She welcomed me into the meeting and, and I walked in and sat in the basement. She bought me an orange crust soda. I remember like it was yesterday. She had the pop machine, she gave me an orange crust soda. And I sat there in this meeting. She sat next to me. And everybody had to talk because there wasn't anybody, hardly anybody in the meeting. And so everybody had to say something. And they all shared. I was like one of the last ones to share. But when it came my time to share, I I, I made a declaration that I'm here because the DOC said I had to come. I only got so many days left and you will never see me again because I'm not like you people. I don't belong here. You know, I gave my whole my whole deal. And, uh, and this woman who was such a gentle soul, sweet soul, <laughs> who bought me the orange crust soda turned on me in the meeting and she grew horns, fangs, and a tail right there in the middle of the meeting, you know, flame shot out of her mouth. And she looked at me right in the middle of me and called me out. And she said, just keep drinking, you dumb little bastard. It's all going to happen to you. And, uh, and she became my first resentment Alcoholics Anonymous, Millie Mays. But the beautiful part, I won't get back around to Millie, so I'll miss it now. But many years later, when she had her 30th anniversary, yours truly was invited to come and share at her 30th anniversary in the middle of Missouri. Uh, and that was a blessing. And, and, uh, and uh, by that time she was almost blind. She sat in the very front row, but she was smiling ear to ear and she was full of the spirit and full of sobriety and um, an amazing lady in our, in, in the middle of Missouri for sure. And made Millie Mays, but that was my first introduction. And then the Thomas boys picked me up the day I was released from treatment and uh, I don't know about the Thomas boys in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, but the Thomas boys were on that. Are nine guys you want showing up to pick you up from treatment. So Johnny and Tommy Thomas picked me up, but we got in the back of pickups. Back then you could all ride in the back of the pickups as well as in the front with no real hardship from law enforcement. So we just all pile in this truck and off we get summertime and we go off to the Sheraton River to one of the best parties I've ever been to in my life, if I'm being honest. And they handed me a big milk jug when I got in the back of the truck full of Everclear and Kool-Aid. I said, here. And literally within minutes of leaving treatment, I was already hammering it back. And we got to this party on the Sheraton River. And again, it was one of the most awesome parties I've ever been to in my life. And what I thought was the highlight of the night is I got this coin for for, for finishing this program. And I went down with the, some buddies down to the river and I made some sarcasm about this coin and skipped it across the river and pounded my chest and made some hillbilly rebel yell like I had victory over the DOC and treatment and uh, I'm free now and I can just get on with with this way of life that we so endure and love. And, um, and it would be a long time before I ever embrace recovery again 
and uh, and, and and pay a lot of consequences along the way. I mean, alcoholism was very punitive to me from day one. I didn't have a lot of stretches uh, where it was just a lot of good times and thrills. But I'll backtrack a little bit. I, I was born in on the Iowa, or excuse me, on the Kansas Oklahoma border, in a little town called Nevada, Missouri to the greatest mom on the planet, my mom. Her name was Mama Long, we called her Mama Long. And uh, my mom, unfortunately, was married to two alcoholics. And the, and the first one was here in St. Louis and she had a son and two daughters out of that. And it was typical alcoholism. It was just a lot of insanity, a lot of darkness in that. And enough that it, over time, she finally just left. She just had enough of it. She couldn't take it and she left the kids with him and she left and she was MIA for 10 years. Nobody knew my mom was dead or alive. I mean, she was just gone. And she resurfaced 10 years later in this little town called Nevada, Missouri, all the way on the other side of the state in a state mental hospital where she was a patient for a good little while. And uh, but she got well enough. I don't know if she met my dad before she got out, how how she ever met my dad. I never really heard the story. But anyway, I get out. She's married to this guy or she gets out. She's married. And a couple, not too long after that, I, I was born. And somewhere between age two and three, this this merry-go-round of alcoholism was full blast again with this guy. And she just ran him off and uh, and just turned her will and life over to God as she understood God at her stage of life. She had no siblings. Her parents died young. So I never knew any of my grandparents. I never had any aunts or uncles to speak of. My mom was only was the full package for me. But thank God she turned her will and life over to to the God of her understanding, which was her Catholic root. She and uh, she dug herself back to the Catholic Church, and she never wavered on that until she died in 2015. And and this woman matured and blossomed into this just incredible story in her life. And I was on the the the, the beginning things of that in the Bay of Missouri. And we lived in a beat up old house. We didn't have any money. It was an old quadplex, and we shared a bathroom with a lady next door. And, uh, but I had a mom who told me she loved me every day of my life. And I had a mom who wanted me to know about this God, this, this higher power, this Jesus. And so she, uh, she was adamant that she'd get me in a parochial school, uh, even though we didn't have any money, but she worked that out somehow. But my mom gave me everything a kid could want, you know, you know, that you would need in this world to, to thrive and, and survive. We didn't have monetary stuff. Materialism wasn't a thing for us, but we had each other. But, you know, I started, I, I became a drummer at a very young age and I was very gifted at it. And it served me well throughout my life playing drums and percussion. And and uh, and I was a good ball player. You know, I was a really decent ball player. Had I never met King Alcohol, I don't know that I could have ever been good enough to play for the Cardinals, <laughs> but I bet I could have played for the Cubs. You know, I'm just saying, I, I think I could have hung in there long enough to do that. But uh but that's that's how I started out, and I went to you know, and I was going to this little Catholic school, and I went to mass every day, and I'm not uh, a member that would get on here and, and have anything to say negative about that experience or with the church. Um, as far as I can remember, back to those days, I enjoyed every bit of it, and uh, I enjoyed going to mass every day. I know I enjoyed it enough that I used to come home and play church. I don't know if any of you ever played church, but I played church once in a while, not all the time, but once in a while, and I get the TV trays out, and make a cool altar, and throw a blanket or afghan over it so it looked kind of like the one at church and dump the fruit out of the fruit bowl fill it full of potato chips for the eucharist and get some grape kool-aid for the wine and um you know get a cheap cow out for a stole get a bible out i can promise you we never read and uh save a few souls at the long house it was a great day you know that's that's how i started out the rock operas for uh, tommy and god's bill and jesus christ superstar and hair um the jesus revolution was going on the peace love movement was going on uh, and, and I loved all that stuff and all that stuff shaped who I was, you know, and we're always shaped by our culture and our context and that stuff all shaped who I was, you know, growing up. I mean, I can still sing those soundtracks to all four of those rock operas backwards and forwards if you put them in right now, I know them by heart. Um, so that's how I started out in life. And, and I, and, uh, and I, and as looking back in those times, I didn't really have any real hangups at that point in time, other than we just didn't have much, but but my, but how my life shifted was somewhere between age eight or nine. My mom said, look, we're going to move back to St. Louis. And I said, why? And she said, because uh, you got a brother and two sisters you don't know about. And a whole chapter to my mom's life opened up that I never knew existed. And then it was like I didn't even know who this person was. You know, and there was doubts and lack of trust and uh, resentment and all that stuff really started pouring my life. And we came to St. Louis and we moved to the outskirts of St. Louis into this old mobile home park. And we lived in the back of the park 
in this beat up old trailer where everybody was called trailer trash. And that's where we lived. And, uh, and we couldn't, she couldn't, uh, work at her work her magic with the parochial school anymore. So I was thrown into a public school system, went from a little town of, you know, a school of less than a hundred kids to a school of thousands of kids. And this is where my life changed. This is where in our book on page 62, it says, when we look back at our life, we see we were driven by a hundred forms of fear. And, um, and this is where I can look back and inventory and really see that starting to take place. I, I, I call it the delusion of inequality. The delusion that just who I am, as I am, isn't enough. And that delusion plagued me. And it had a lot of power over me. You know, that ego that came with it, the pride and the fear being sandwiched between that. And what you thought of me paralyzed me. And it's this all this really started to take grassroots in my life at this point in time. I didn't look like anybody else when we got to St. Louis. I looked like a little country kid from Nevada. But everybody else looked like hippies. I had short hair, you know, I wore blue jeans and cowboy boots. Everybody here was wearing hiking boots, bell bottoms, and blue jean jackets and grow long hair. So immediately I just changed how I looked. Everything about me changed. I mean, immediately I went out and got big bell bottom pants. That was a, that was a thing. I had brown suede boots with red shoe strings. Billy Jack was a badass on TV at the time. So I love Billy Jack. So I got Billy Jack t-shirt and blue jean jackets, and I grew my hair real long. I had, I had big gap teeth, I had freckles, I had pimples. I made a headband out of a piece of belt. I looked like a freaked out How Do You Do magazine. That's what I look like, if you know who that is. You know, that, I look like that guy uh, with long hair. And, uh, and, and I was just trying to be cool, man. I was just trying to fit in and overcome this delusion of inequality that who I was wasn't enough. I was a rock and roll drummer. So I got invited into circles I didn't belong in with hanging around kids I didn't even had no business hanging around. I had a mom who worked two or three jobs all the time. So by the age of 10, I just did what I wanted, really. I just came in and, and went as I pleased. And when you're hanging around older teens, people in their 20s and 30s, and they're all living in the dark, the dark things are going to happen. So all the abuses you could come up with, verbal, physical, mental, spiritual, sexual, I experienced all that before I was even a teenager, hanging around this crowd of people. And it all had an impact on my life, for sure. Uh, my mom drank her whole life. So the day she died, my mom always had the cheapest beer in the refrigerator, and she always had a fifth of old curl whiskey underneath the sink. And uh, and she smoked Virginia Slims for a long time. She quit the last 20-something years of her life. But that's who my mom was. Did I sneak some of her liquor, drink off some of her beers, and smoke her cigarettes? Yeah, I, I did all those things. I, I, did I slip some of the, the ultra wine at church? You bet. That, I don't call any of that my first drink. My, I, you know, When I refer to my first drink, I'm talking about the first time I experienced the magic the intoxication, the, the shift in my life that changed everything. And that happened somewhere right around between age 12 and 13, somewhere in that age bracket. Um, and, and I was playing music with a bunch of guys and they were a lot older than I was. And one of the guys was a 17 year old kid. His parents went to Florida. He said, hey man, I'm having a party, come over. So I went to this house. I'd never been to a party before or nothing like it. And uh, walk in and he's behind the bar playing the bartender. and. There's lots of people, girls and smoke and dope and loud music and a little intimidating by all of it. But he asked me the all important question, man, what are you drinking? And nobody ever asked me that before in my life. I said, man, I guess whatever you're drinking is what I'm drinking. I didn't even know how to answer it. And he gave me a big glass of slow gin and Coke. I remember like it was yesterday. And I went over and sat on the couch and I looked at it and looked around the room and finally got the courage. And it took courage to take a drink of it because I didn't know what it was going to do to me. And I finally took a pull off it and it tasted like cough syrup. I said, this isn't no big deal. And I finally took a few more pulls and I started to get that sensation in our body that we get from King alcohol. And eventually I started to get a smile like on my face like I never had before. A smile that my mama's love didn't do it for me, playing music, sports, none of that did it for me. But King alcohol gave me a smile I had never had before. And I continued to drink and the smile got bigger and the more I drank, it got even bigger. And eventually it wrapped all the way around my head. The smile just went all the way around my head. And it was an apocalyptic moment. I mean, when I say apocalyptic, I mean something that unveiled to you you never experienced before in your life. It was a game changer. And and I didn't say it, I definitely didn't say it that day, but I pretty much just planted a flag and said, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. And not just not just the intake of alcohol, but the whole experience. I loved all of it. I love you know, Bill refers to it as a gay chatter. I loved all of it. And I just wanted to do it again. I got as sick as I've ever been off alcohol that night. And, and I know I lied to my mom about what was wrong with me that night. And uh, I didn't drink the next day, the next week, or the next month, probably. 
you know, I said, I'm sure I said my first foxhole prayer, you know, God, get me out of this. I was so sick from it. But my life changed that night. And, and every, my whole ambitions in life, anything I had in life was to experience that magic again and again and again. And, and the reality of it is, as we sit here right now, even though we're just a small group on Zoom, there's millions and not billions of people around the world right this second trying to capture that same feeling that we've been free from. And I just never want to forget that, that, that freedom from that desire to want to drink has been lifted for almost 38 years now. So I'm forever grateful for that. But at that point, it was just beginning. And my whole life shifted. We didn't have any money. I'd already told you that. So I, I, I started robbing and, and, and burglarizing. And that got me in a lot of trouble. And I ended up in boys' homes and juvenile penitentiaries and out of school by the time I was 13, out of the house by the time I was 15. And I just grew up on the streets. You know, I just grew up running from one place to the next, basically a fugitive and, a, and an unhoused misfit going from one spot to the next, wherever I could create. I was a hustler, man. I could hustle with the best. I was a survivor, but I could drink. I didn't, I, I couldn't have anything. And I'd still find a way to get intoxicated all the time. And all my drinking, um, all that took me all over the South. I ended up hooking up with a drifter. There was a drifter in the town I was in. Um, and his name was Scotty and Scotty was from Austin and he had this old UPS fan that he turned into a living quarters. And he was just a hippie, a big, tall hippie, six foot four, six foot five, skinny. And he had, to, he was cool. I thought he was really cool. And he was headed back to Austin. I said, man, I think I want to go to Texas. I wasn't even 16 years old yet. And he said, well, come on. And it worked out where I could go to take off with a guy I barely knew. I wasn't even old enough to drive a car yet. And off we went to Texas. And I lived all over the South for a long time. I lived in Texas and Tennessee and Georgia. And when I got to Georgia is when I had my first real, any kind of real surrender in my life, any type of real self-honesty about my drinking, about my life, about where I was at. And it I lived in this beat up old trailer park called Red Barn Trailer Court in Ackworth, Georgia. And, I, and it was like all the misfits from the South were on my street. I don't think, there was anybody from Georgia on my street. It's like they got kicked out of Carolinas and Kentucky and Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama. You know, it's like, get out of our state. And they made it to Red Barn Trailer Court because I live with a whole bunch of them on my street. How bad was it? <laughs> I live next door to three guys named Porkchop, Hollywood, and Screwdriver. That should give you an idea who the clientele that we had on that block. But it was on that block that I had my first real moment. And if you're new to alcohol, it's anonymous, you know, you hear, you'll hear a lot about the disease, the illness, the malady, uh, the, the alcoholic mind, the, the, the disease of perception. You'll hear these different terminologies trying to describe our relationship with King Alcohol. And, and in other words, you hear around the rooms often, really came out of the treatment center world back in the 70s and 80s and became popular, but it's a word that's only mentioned twice in a big book, and that's the word denial. And the word denial is only mentioned twice in the book, once on page 10 and once in the spiritual appendix, and both times talking about denying a power greater than ourself. The way our book describes alcoholism is way past denial. Denial is a part of the human experience. We deny a lot of things. And denial is, I know that TV's on the wall behind me, but I'm not going to look at it. But I know it's there, right? But it, but that's denial. But our way our book describes alcoholism is way past it. It describes it on the basis of delusion, an illusion, meaning I can't see myself for what I really am, and I can't differentiate the truth from the false. That's way past denial, and it's that dilemma that is the plight of the alcoholic. Denial, again, I know that TV and that sunflowers are right behind me, but delusion, it's sitting right across from me looking at me just like I'm looking at Jeannie right this second, and I can't see it for what it is. That's the delusion. I can't see my life for what it is, and, uh, and, and that's that cunning, cunning, baffling, powerful nature of alcoholism is why most people will burn their life to the ground, go through the gates of insanity and die. And that's most people. I mean, it, it just truly is. You Google how many anticipated alcoholic speculated alcoholics there are in the world. It's millions and millions and millions. But how many people are that we know of are in recovery? Two or three million? I mean, it's not even a close number. And, just, and if you've been around long enough, you know it's true because just the amount of people you watch cycle in, cycle out. It's, it's a brutal illness, and it's so seated in this delusion. Uh, it's just so embedded in delusion. And so this is what that delusion looks like. And this is, this is really important because this, you know, 
how any of us survive is beyond me. I and mean, this is a great example of what I'm talking about. So I'm 19 years old. I'm living in Ackworth, Georgia, Red Barn for the court. And, uh, and I'm, a, I'm a, a, a honky tonk drinker. I play music in the honky tonks. I love the honky tonks. I love the saloons. You could easily label me a saloonatic, right? Because I love the saloons. I love all those places. And I still do today. My sponsor lives in Nashville. I don't go to Nashville without going down on Broadway and going to all the honky tonks. And I love all this. I still love the gay chatter. I can go to those places free today. I couldn't back then. But I was drinking in, uh, you know, and I was a blackout drinker. So from day one, I was a blackout drinker. I didn't blackout every time, but most of the time, it, you know, there was periods of the evening that I didn't, or the day I didn't remember. But I woke up at uh, Ackworth, Georgia on a Saturday morning, wintertime with my cowboy boots on, my blue jeans. I had on a flannel shirt and a beige fashion. I didn't even make it to my bed. I was still on the trailer floor when I woke up in the morning. And I had a big tomato head. That's what we call a, a hangover in the South. I had a big tomato head, you know, my head was just pounding. I wake up sit up on the trailer floor and as i look i realize i got dry blood all over my hands i got dry blood all over my vest and i'm like man oh man what happened to me last night and i couldn't remember any of it and of course you get paranoid and i got up and went into the bathroom and i started looking trying to figure out where i was bleeding from because i had a gift maybe some of you had this gift but i had a gift of those honky tonks that didn't happen every time but if i was drinking hard liquor or mixing it with anything else it wasn't uncommon that somebody wanted to jack me one before the night was out. I had that gift. I don't know if you had it, but I had it. And uh, so waking up with a pop down on your head didn't happen every time, but it wasn't uncommon. So I'm looking for a pop down. I'm looking to where I might be wounded. But it wasn't until I got undressed that I realized somebody had sliced me all the way around my arm and stabbed me in the rib cage. To this day, I couldn't tell you what happened that night, and which is graphic and horrific enough. But what happened next is really an important part of the story. And if you're new, this is the alcoholic mind. This is that delusion in action. Here's a real example of how that looks in my life. So I went down on the front porch of this trailer. I got really emotional, highly emotional. And I said to myself, mumbling to myself, you know, with tears in my eyes, man, I got to do something different than what I'm doing. And King Alcohol, our, our, our authors of our book took an old English character named John Barleycorn and they, they personified King Alcohol. And I always love that analogy, that illustration, that metaphor of just King Alcohol sitting right next to me with his arm around me, consoling me. I call him the great compromiser because alcoholism will definitely compromise with you. And this is how it sounded in my mind. Man, I got to do something different than what I'm doing. And King Alcohol says, you know what, kid? You're right. You do need to do something different. But before you do anything drastic, throw on your old army jacket and let's hoof, up there, hoof it up here to the magic market and get a quart of beer and a pack of smokes. And that sounded like a really sound idea. This is a delusion. Kid. Anybody in the right mind said, man, are you out of your mind? But, but at that moment, there was nothing between me and King Alcohol. And it sounded like the most rational thing on the planet. And I went and got the jacket. I didn't even wash the blood off my hands. I got the jacket and I started walking up to that magic market. And that sense of ease and comfort came over me before I ever got there. I'm already feeling better before I ever got there. I'm almost skipping to the liquor store. I'm so excited. And I get to the liquor store and I get the quarter beer and I get the pack of smokes and I twist that cap, make that noise we love and that spirit comes out of the bottle and I take a mighty pull off it, make that face. We always make that first drink of the day. And that was the last time I thought about not drinking for a long time. And that's alcoholism to the T. I hitchhiked to Marietta, Georgia. I got sold up and again, that was that would be the last time in a long time that I would think about not drinking. I came back to St. Louis in 1985. My bottom came pretty fast. I got arrested for a 4 TWI conviction. Uh, not that many weeks later, I was involved in a multi-fatality drunk driving accident. I wasn't driving, but I was a passenger in the other uh, car. Everybody in the other car lost their life that night. Every, everybody on both sides was just fully intoxicated. And I came home way after daylight from that whole experience. And I was just shell shocked i was devastated i was crushed it was like somebody took out my soul and cut it in half but as i sat there in that beautiful apartment in st louis missouri there was nothing between me and king alcohol and as i have mumbled those words man i gotta do something different in my life king alcohol is right kid before you do anything just go grab a cold beer and let's sit here and think this out and i'm psh, popping the top smoking another cigarette trying to think it out and only to get behind the wheel of the car one more time a few weeks later and I got arrested for a 50 WI, which were felonies because it was the same jurisdiction. I had felonies and a parole violation. So I was on my way back to the penitentiary once again. And uh, and they had me in this cell by myself. And it was in that cell in 1987 that I got down on my knees 
and I said the most honest prayer ever said in my life. And this is where all the rock operas, all the, the, the Catholic schools, my mom was insistence that I knew this power. This is whatever that gave me at that time, this is where it came full circle. And I got on my knees and I, and I said the most honest prayer I've ever said in my life. God, help me. I don't even know if I said please, to be honest with you. But, but it was an honest prayer. And I think that's the difference between all the foxhole prayers I ever said in my life up to that point. Lord knows I said many prayers. We all do. Lord, God, get me out of this. I'll never do it again. But we wore that prayer out. You know you know how you wore it out because you had to add this to it. Because this time, <laughs> I really mean it. You know, that's how you know you wore that prayer out. You just time, time, time again. But this time, it was different. And the only thing I could add to it was that it was honest. And our book says that God doesn't make too hard turns for those who honestly seek God. And I was, I was honestly seeking, and I've never had a drink since that day till now. And I bailed out of there, and I knew I needed to go back to treatment. Um, I didn't need anybody to tell me that. I knew I was in a lot of trouble. I, needed, I knew I was going to have to plead for my life in front of the judge, and I knew it would be a lot easier if I could stand there with a piece of paper and said, I've already been to treatment, and I'm on my way to recovery again. And I went all the way back to where I was at in 1980. This is that where that adequate demonstration comes full circle. Lots of places to go in St. Louis, but I didn't know any of them. But I knew about that place where I was at all the way, all those years before. It was a different name, but it was the same town. And I went back to that place. And I didn't go there to get sober for the rest of my life. I didn't go there to do what we're doing tonight. Had no intentions. I, had any, any, I had no idea what recovery even meant. I just knew I didn't want to drink anymore. I didn't want to live that life anymore. Um, I definitely, you know, I wouldn't, I would have plea bargained and said, I'll take the drink and if I can do it with, with impunity without problems. But I knew that I was at a space where I knew I couldn't do that. And I went back there and I got 12 step by a guy who was only two and a half months sober. He was the Ebby Thatcher in my life. We all had the Ebbies. Most of us got multiple Ebbies, but he was my Ebby. And he wasn't there to be my sponsor or get me the steps. He was just a guy who had two and a half months of sobriety. He was my age now, a little bit younger. And he just come back to the treatment. He's an this and he was just excited about his sobriety and he was on fire for it. And uh, he was just coming back to share the good news. And it's not just good news if you're an alcoholic, it's the best news ever. And he was just coming back to share the best news ever. And and uh, he took me to my first AA meeting outside of that, that facility. And I remember going into that meeting downtown St. Louis. And how I remember it because of his car. Because he came to my room and he says, hey, do you want to go to this meeting? And I said, what kind of meeting is it? And he says, it's an AA meeting. I said, I don't want to go to the AA meeting. And then he left. And then he came back a few minutes later and he stuck his just his head to the door and he smiled at me. He says, Well, do me a favor. I said, What's that? He goes, I want you to try real hard to smile and get it over with. And then he just laughed. And you know, he was very sarcastic. And he and he won my confidence with, with some sarcasm. Because the next thing I know, I'm strolling the halls looking for this guy. And I finally found him. And I said, Hey, you still going to that meeting? He goes, Yeah. And he goes, I see. And I said, Well, I'm gonna go with you. He goes, That's good. I said, Why is that so good? He goes, Because I can't get anybody else to go. Then I knew I swallowed the hook. I'm like, what did I just say yes to? But I'm off and I go with this guy. And we go down two little stores, a little bitty treatment center, two stories, and we get to the parking lot, and there's the newcomer car. And we could pass the cash app tonight and pay for that car. It was a piece of crap. 19, and there's no exaggeration, it's a 1970 P grain Plymouth Duster. And we go get in that thing, and there's no no exhaust on the car. And there's trash everywhere, there's holes in the floorboard. It's just a piece of junk car. And we get in this car and he cranks this thing up with no exhaust. It's super loud. And off we go into town, little bitty rural, Kirksville, Missouri to be exact, downtown where all the churches are at. So we can go to this meeting and he's got a smile that wraps all the way around his head. And why? Because he's spiritually intoxicated. He's bringing the new guy. He's on fire. You know, he's supercharged about this whole deal. And he starts telling me we're going down the road. <laughs> You know, it's loud and nauseous. Carbon dioxide is pouring through the floorboards. You're trying to not die from asphyxiation. And he's over here trying to tell you how great his life is now that he quit drinking. And I think I, I invented the word right there. I'm like, dude, I hate to admit it to you, but man, it looks like your life sucks to me. You know, you know, Kevin looking at him, looking at his car, and he started laughing. He goes, yeah, well, tell me about your car. Well, I don't even have a car. You know, and he goes, and, and you got a big trial coming up. How's that going for you? You know, he just stuck a jagger in me and started turning it. You know, he got me back real quick. So touche. I shut my mouth after that. But we got to the meeting and he said, now we're going to go on this meeting tonight. And he goes, this is going to be really important. And I said, what's that? He goes, if they call on you, let's hope they don't call on you. But if they would call on you, all I want you to say is my name's Harold and I'm an alcoholic. And don't add anything to it. When you say alcoholic, it's got a broad definition. We know what that means. It means you probably smoked some of this. You probably huffed some of that. You probably took some of those. You probably did some of that. And uh, But don't add on it. Just, just be Harold the alcoholic. 
you know, we know what that means. And uh, you're, you're an Ozark Mountain hillbilly, for God's sake. You probably slept with a few farm animals. That's what he said to me. So we know what it means. And, you know, of course, I'll laugh at that. And But I've been a herald of alcoholic ever since. And that's probably some of the best advice I ever got. And I walked into that meeting and I sat next to this guy, a complete stranger. And I asked him this question. And everybody in AA has had this question at some point in their sobriety, usually early on. Here's the question. How long do I got to come here? You know? How long do I got to do this stuff? Because everything in my life had been time. Is it two months? Is it two years? How long? How long do whatever we do here, then I can just say, I'm done. Thank you. See you later. And the guy was kind of taken back by that question. But he looked at me and he, he says, until you want to. And I said, man, I don't even want to be here tonight, much less tomorrow night. And I darn sure don't want to be here when I look like you. That's what I was thinking to myself. But 38 years later, I look just like that guy. So somewhere along the line, I crossed that that threshold where I had to come to this place because my life depended on it that, that I wanted to come here. I can't tell you when that exactly happened, but it happened. But I came back to St. Louis and I didn't go to AA. I was consumed with the trial and that's all I cared about. I was just trying to avoid going back to the penitentiary, period. And that persistent Abby of mine, that guy named Gary kept calling me on the landline. We didn't have so did you go to AA? I said, no. And he goes, why? I said, I can't tell you why, man. I can't tell you why. And he goes, well, your life depends on it, man. So you need to go. And I knew that was a true statement and I sure didn't want it to be. It's the last thing I wanted to be true. And I knew it was true. But I finally, through his persistence, walked into the rooms of AA, which is a huge step for any, any alcoholic to walk into a room on your own, step across that threshold, sit down, raise your hand, and say, I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. That's not easy. And, uh, and really and take it seriously. And I, and I finally did that. Unfortunately, I came to AA like I did everything else in my life. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want, the way I want. If you don't like it, well, too bad, because that's how I flow. And so I didn't want the whole, everything you had to offer me. I, I look at the 12 steps in, it did, in my mind because as I had too much individualism and materialism and consumerism and secularism in my life, I couldn't manifest in my mind how that was going to change my life. It didn't make any sense to me. It was foreign. And uh, in sponsorship, I had a probation and parole officer since I was 11 years old, and I still had one. And now you're asking me to invite somebody else to have say so in my life? I don't think so. So I didn't want to sponsor. So I just, you know, I just, there's three types of people that come to AA. There's those who make it happen. There's those who watch it happen. And there's those who don't know what's happening at all. And I've been all three of those cats. I absolutely had no clue what was going on when I got here. I watched it happen for the first almost three years. It was, but it was three years before I finally came all the way in, sat all the way down and committed to stay. And if you're new tonight, that's really what has to happen. You have to come all the way in, you have to sit all the way down and you have to commit to stay. And staying is the hard part because life will come at you, man. And it's going to suck sometimes. And it's not easy sometimes. And the pain of being sober sometimes can feel like it's more painful than the pain of being fully inebriated and trying to fight those demons. But if you stay and you just stay close to the middle and you stay close to the people that are really living this out, you'll you'll weather those storms or as Bill would say, you'll survive the trials and low spots. And then you'll move on to the greatest experience you've ever had in your life. And that's really what the Alaska guy to sponsor me at three years of sobriety. I went to his house. He lived right up the street from me. I could walk because I didn't have a car or a license. And I sat with him and, and he knew me the whole time. And I, and I said, will you be my sponsor? He goes, yeah, well, let's tell me a little bit about your life. And I said, I'll tell you about my life. I said, I'm 25 years old. I live in a beat up old house in the basement down the road from you. I don't have an education. I don't have a GED. I got a criminal record. I don't have a driver's license. I don't know if I'll ever have a driver's license. I got a dead end job. My life sucks just every which way you want to take it. Take the word sucks, capitalize it, italicize it, make a neon sign of it, for God's sake. That's what my life said. And he listened to me very gracefully, and he said, Harold, I'll be the first to admit you've been dealt a really cruddy hand in life, a really tough hand in your life, no doubt about it. But I hope you're going to hear what i got to tell you, because it's the truth. And what he told me that night is as true that night as it is tonight on August the 14th, 2024. He said, Harold, every single thing you have in your life, every single thing you have in your life, you've attracted to you by the person you become. And the day you're man enough to own that truth is the day you're on your way to some real change. But until you can own that truth, this vicious cycle you're on, you're eventually going to drink again because you're not happy about your sobriety. And I know you don't think so because you don't have a desire to drink right this second. But trust me, you're like a candle in the wind. That, that wick's going to go out and you will drink again. 
or you're going to do what your dad did. And my dad was an alcoholic who I barely knew. I only seen a handful of times. Last time I saw my dad was when I was 14, when I got sentenced for the first time, he came to the trial for that, uh, to the, to the, to the sentencing of that. That's the last time I saw my dad, but he could never, never get sober and age 54. He took his life. That's how my dad quit drinking. But since you're going to do one of those two things. So it ultimately boils down to this. You're either going to grow or you're going to go. And the million dollar question is, what do you want to do? And I didn't want to go. I loved AA. I, I had a sober band. I had a lot of friends. I lived, you know, I was, fellowship saved my life. No question about it. But I didn't have the spiritual transformation. I didn't get unclogged. That this is the, the channel between us and God and higher power and each other. I had been blocked off my whole life. And it was still blocked off, even though I hadn't drank in three years. And this has to get unclogged or you're not going to stay here. And that's what the steps do, especially four through nine. They they get in the business of uncovering, discovering, discarding as Chuck C would say, what's in this channel? What's blocking us? Because it really, at the end of the day, that's what we have is a separation problem. And uh, and I had it my whole life, a separated from this power. And and so was I willing to go on that journey and, and, and really get into what was in here? And I was. As I became willing and, and I did, and it changed my whole life. And it didn't happen in one big cataclysmic explosion, but little by little, my life took off and it started to change. My sponsor was Tom High from North Carolina. Most of my sobriety or a big chunk of it. Some of you may know Tom, he passed away a few years ago. He died with 65 years of sobriety. He was a, a, a rock, a bedrock, especially in this, well, all over the world, really, but, but definitely in the South, in North Carolina, he was, he was the, one of the main grassroots guys and he would I got connected with him as in a whole other story but he was the main guy in my life and Tom had a quote it's a, it's a it's a it's an adaption of an old another quote but he how he adapted it I loved it and what he said was was when preparation meets opportunity and God does introduction great things can happen in your life and that's exactly what the steps did they prepared me for the opportunities to become the best version of me that I could ever be um, and it was always there for the taking I just needed to remove what was blocking me. And the steps created a way for that to happen. And it changed my life. And I never looked back from that day till now. And it, it's been an incredible ride. As I sit here today, I'm fully educated. I've got two master's degrees and almost a doctorate degree in my life. I, I got five kids. I've raised five kids in recovery. None of them have ever seen me drink. I got four great, I got four grandkids that are just the, the bomb. I have an incredible life. And I've had some highs and lows. You know, if you looked at my life, it's like a stock chart. If you can run it from 1925 till now, the an S&P 500 fund, it's pretty much up with a few recessions. That's my life. But, you know, I've been able to wave that storm. But it's been a heck of a ride. And I'll, and I'll close with this. Uh, on page 152, the, the member, the person just like me and you, asked the fellowship a question. And here's the question. It's a, it's a fair question. It's, and everybody has this question. And here's the question. Do you have a sufficient substitute for King alcohol? The magic, the magic that I was willing to sell my soul basically to the devil to, uh, to, to, to keep, to keep that magic going in my life. Do you have a sufficient substitute for that? And the book responds with yes. And it's vastly more than that. It's a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that word fellowship, the way they use it is in a verb form, meaning I have to participate in my own recovery. But if you come all the way in, you sit all the way down and you stay and you stay committed, you live in recovery and visit the world, not live in the world and try to visit recovery. But if you stay centered here, that the most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead of you. And it's the truth that your imagination will be fired. It's the truth. You're going to make lifelong friends, evidence right here, right now. But most importantly, and I think this is the most important part, is you're going to learn as you heal, as as, as your life comes full circle, as you get transformed, if you would, you're going to have, and I'm paraphrasing now from page 152 to 153, but it says you're going to have the privilege to walk shoulder to shoulder with other people and help them rediscover life. And if you do that long enough, you're going to finally know what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, that you're going to have that experience. These are my words to move from a taker to a giver. And that shift has to happen if you're going to stay here, but that shift is where all the magic happens in this life. And so it gave me a new formula for living. And the formula for living is simply this. Every day you get up, you go out and you try to live a life of humility, self-sacrifice, other-centeredness, and try to love everybody, including your enemies. And if you can go out and do that one day at a time, it leads to a pretty 
credible life. And that's exactly what I had. So if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome here. I hope you come all the way in. I hope you sit all the way down. I hope you stay and you give yourself the, the, the impossible becomes possible every day in AA. I can promise you it will happen for you too. If you just stay, stay is the hard part, but it gave me a life. Well, thank you for my life. Thank you, Hattiesburg, for letting me come and hang out with you tonight. Great to make some new friends. And uh, friends, that's all I got. God bless.